Well, San Diego Air and Space Museum is hosting its annual International Air and Space Hall of Fame gala tonight. Two influential women in the world of aviation are now a part of the Hall of Fame. Barbara Barrett, who is currently serves as Secretary of the United States Air Force, and Tammy Jo Schultz, who's one of the first female fighter pilots in U the U.S. Navy. Tonight's gala starts at 6 p.m. and will, of course, be virtual because of COVID-19. And joining us now to talk all about it is one of the inductees, Tammy Jo Schultz. Tammy Jo, thank you so much for joining us. We are honored to have you on the show. Well, thank you, Jason. Your story, I mean, there's, there's so much to unpack here. You're a little girl growing up in New Mexico. You watch the, near, the jets from the nearby Air Force Base fly around. You're interested. You're told there's no professional jobs for women. You try to get in the Air Force, they say no, but things changed when you applied to the Navy. Talk to us about that. Yes, it's it's certainly a lesson in uh, some of the, the no's that we have in life are really well-placed because the Air Force said no, the Army said no, and the Navy said, take a test. And uh, it would take me two more years and three recruiters before they would process that test and make, let me make application. But the Navy was uh, ahead of their time in opening doors. Women flew jets. Uh, the first class of women that flew in the Navy, uh, Rosemary Mariner was in that class. She flew jets and they had opened up their doors for women to fly tactical aircraft in tactical missions. Uh, the combat exclusion policy was in place. So we weren't flying combat, we, but we, we got to fly some other tactical missions. Well, you mentioned Captain Rosemary Mariner, and this is another parallel I find fascinating. She is your predecessor, and, and she was flying, I believe she was flying A-7s. You grew up in New Mexico watching Air Force jets fly overhead at a nearby base. She grew up in San Diego watching Navy jets fly out of Miramar. Talk about the relationship you had with her. Well, I met her when she was the executive officer of VAQ-34, where I, I checked in as a pilot. And... Then she was my commanding officer, but truly she became a mentor and friend of 30 years after leaving the command and helping myself and some other ladies, Pam Carroll, Brenda Shifley, um, Sue Hart, navigate the world of aviation when uh, normally we would be kind of the green apple in a barrel of red uh, <laughs> when we changed into a squadron or, or a community, even commercial aviation didn't have that many women. And so sometimes flying was not the, mo the most challenging thing we faced at that time. Well, when, we, when you left the Navy, you became a pilot, a, a captain with Southwest Airlines. And I wanna take our viewers back a couple of years you had a very, very challenging situation to deal with. You are the pilot in command of a 737 taking off from New York, headed for Dallas, but something happened shortly after takeoff. Tell us about that. We're looking at pictures of the damage after the plane got on the ground. Yes, we, uh, first of all, being the captain certainly uh, was challenging, but uh, I was I was not alone. I had an incredible crew, and crew members always have names. So I would like to take just a moment to name my my crew, which was Darren Elliser, my first officer, my flight attendants Catherine Sandoval, Shanique Mallory, and Rachel Fernheimer. We met uh, most of us for the first time that day, and that was our second flight together from LaGuardia to Dallas. We were full of passengers, not a seat empty, and heavy with fuel for a long flight. And Everything was going very well until we passed 32,600 feet. And we heard an explosion and felt like we'd been T-boned by a Mack truck. And uh, on the captain's side, Darren and I both thought we'd been struck by another aircraft. The jolt was so sudden and violent and our aircraft just skidded sideways, pitched over and did a snap roll to the left. Um, regaining control and, and navigating our way to Philadelphia, which was about 50 or 60 miles to our left, took about 20, 22 minutes. And there was really uh, kind of an unscripted combination of emergencies that unfolded uh, as, as we got closer to the ground. And I, our viewers, I'm sure a lot of them remember hearing this. This made national headlines. You had a cabin depressurization. One passenger almost pulled completely out of the jet right? Yes. And so you got it on the ground. 
What was it like when you finally got that aircraft on the ground after all you'd been through? Well, just to back it up a little bit, I'd have to say um, there was such a, a group of courageous people in the cabin. I mentioned my crew, but we also had passengers, Andrew Needham, Tim McGinty, uh, Peggy Phillips, that unbuckled and got up during this rough and pretty violently shuddering flight to help uh, that passenger that you mentioned. And um, getting it on the ground was a challenge uh, right until the end. We, we knew we, we just had one shot at the landing. We were uh, pretty damaged and unable to use the, a lot of the thrust from the good engine because of all the drag on the opposite side and maintaining uh, control of the aircraft. So getting on the ground was certainly um, the goal, and we were grateful to get there. Once on the ground, though, I would have to say I was I was amazed at um, just the the sense that the value of human life had been felt that day. And when I went to the cabin, instead of angry, aggravated, frustrated passengers, I saw people that were calmly caring for each other. Um, and so it was it was pretty amazing just to see how heroes stepped up that day. I'm just curious, uh, personally, were your, were, were your hydraulics compromised in any way? Well, um, the explosion severed the hydraulic lines on yeah. that side and the fuel lines on the captain's side. And um, we just had a kind of a continuous tearing of materials where different uh, like the cowling of the engine had been torn back, kind of peeled back like a banana peeling mm -hmm. and remaining attached underneath the wing at about 500 miles an hour when it happened certainly was the cause of such shuddering. And and then that tearing, you know, it, it kind of continued. Every airspeed had a different um, aileron and rudder input. And so mm -hmm. it was... Uh, that, that saying of aviate, navigate, communicate, sometimes we got caught in aviate, aviate, aviate. But, <laughs> That's uh, under <laughs> very understandable. Well, you, your story is so fascinating. I want to make sure our viewers know about the book that you wrote. I can't wait to read this book. It's called Nerves of Steel. I think there it is right there. Talk to us about the book, what you talk about. Obviously, you talk about the, the, the flight that we have been discussing, but what's, what else is a takeaway from this book? The takeaway would be that, um, you know, uh, Amelia Earhart has a great quote that says, adventure is worthwhile. And I would add on to that and say, we're made for it. Uh, but adventure will always have adversity in it. And I think, though, instead of trying to avoid adversity, I think we need to meet it head on and just realize that adversity is what grooms us. It may chisel us or forge us at times, but that's what makes us ready to meet challenges ahead of us. And adventure is what inspires us to take those challenges on. Tammy Jo Schultz, we are so honored to have you on Good Morning San Diego, proud of your accomplishments, and we congratulate you on your induction into the International Air and Space Hall of Fame Class of 2020. Well-deserved. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for your time.